Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Airspeed's Avatar Rewatch video. This one's going to be for episode 4 of book 1, Water, The Warriors of Kiyoshi. So this is, I suppose, more or less our first uh, regular, like, normal episode that's not so linked in with the series beginning. This is kind of uh, an episode that better represents, I think, what most of the book 1 episodes are. And it's a good one. I, I actually really like this episode. I think it is... Uh, really really good you know is it is a top you know 15 top 20 you know maybe just about towards the the bottom you know not one of the absolute best episodes of the show but ap really 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 solid episode um for what it is and um i think what's so good about it is that even though it is one of these episodes in terms of the plot isn't particularly important it ends up being an important episode just because of like little things like the introduction of Suki, who later becomes an important character. Um, some world building stuff in terms of the introduction of like Kiyoshi as one of the previous avatars and some of the information that comes out there. Um, they later come back to this place obviously to reveal a little bit more information about Kiyoshi Island and I suppose Kiyoshi herself. Um, and then just, you know, overall, it, it, it's a nice episode because it, it gives a little bit of focus on every character. It's more of a, a Sokka, Suki-focused episode. And then Aang and Katara have their little plot in the background of just, you know, you know, Aang trying to impress Katara, Katara not being particularly impressed, and then being a little bit jealous of Aang once other people start giving him attention. That's fine, you know, it's simple, to the point, um, without being, you know, anything amazing. But even like they all, all, they all get their kind of strong moment in that Katara gets to do a really skillful water bending technique where she where she water bends the water out of Aang's lungs, and Aang even though you know get, gets a chance basically showing he is actually better than Zuko at fighting here just that he only really fights Zuko for like a second but in that one second that he actually commits to fighting Zuko he gets the advantage, and. Um, and then at the end gets his kind of more hero moment where he thinks he's leaving this place running away as like a failure. He's just brought nothing but like devastation to this village. He gets the chance to, I suppose, give something back when he, you know, finally actually rides the Unagi properly and, you know, you know basically puts the water all over the village to put out the fires that Zuko caused. And it's this sense of like, okay, like... You know, Zuko didn't go out necessarily with the purpose of just burning down the village. It was more of just, uh, as a result of him fighting, he didn't realize how much damage he was causing. I ended up putting that out. It sort of saved the village, even though it has damaged things. But it, it confirms to Aang that they're going to need to not be as um, kind of open with who they are going forward. They can't just walk into every village and say, I'm the Avatar, you know, let's do this. He has to be more kind of careful about who he lets know he is the avatar and where exactly they go and so on so you know a lot of a lot of little things here um as as well as just it, it, there being some kind of really nicely written stuff just with how how zuko ends up discovering that ang is even on kiyoshi island of just with the the idea of the fish being caught and you know the story following that fish on the way to zuko's plate is how the story gets to him i thought that was really nicely done because the fish was caught, you know, on Kyoshi Island and makes it back to Zuko and then Zuko comes back. That's a really kind of clever little transition thing, uh, how they do it. Um, just before I get to, I suppose, the big stuff with Sokka, um, we get two of our kind of more funny kind of gag moments in this episode that are kind of like the memes of Avatar. Obviously, Foamy Mouth Guy, um, we get to see him a few times and here's where he obviously makes his debut and he is one of the most kind of randomly amazing kind of funny moments from the show with just his over-the-top reaction to Aang foaming at the mouth and then Pole Guy who is probably one of the ones where like it kind of really speaks to like how involved in the fandom were you if you know who Pole Guy is or you don't know who he is so um, in the scene where Aang and Katara are talking as Katara is putting the su supplies into the kind of basket that she has and it's really getting across the whole idea of, you know, like Aang saying you're jealous, aren't you? And Katara saying that, no, I'm not. You're letting the girls go to your head. In the background, you just see this guy having a, a really just intense, what looks like conversation with just a plank of wood, basically. This kind of wooden pole, basically, he's standing in front of. And 
it's just in the background, basically, behind Aang's shoulder. And you just see it going from, like, him just kind of being, like, the, like animated, like, talking to it, um, to suddenly, like, okay, he's more of that. And then he's on the ground, like, he's just been really upset or something like that. It's just this really random background moment but um it's it's something that the fandom kind of has latched onto a little bit and it, it tends to kind of be one of the more forgotten kind of uh gag moments in the series but um yeah so yeah covering some of the other stuff before Sokka um Kyoshi Island Kyoshi Warriors and yeah the the, the line here that like I don't know if I if I necessarily I'm immediately going to say this is a negative they didn't have this planned out but they, I think they do this a f in a few cases early on, where they do place year dates on certain things. Like here they say, Avatar Kyoshi was born here 400 years ago. And I don't think the plan was that they always wanted Kyoshi to be this avatar who lived to be 230 years old. I don't think that was the plan. So they just committed to it like, okay, let's just say some people in the avatar world can live to be that old if the circumstances are correct. Now admittedly we do have a few other characters who are over a hundred, Guru Pratik's like 150 and, and so on, Sozin lived to be older and and so on, but 230 feels like a little bit of a stretch and it, and it is because of the dates that they give here 400 years ago. That seems like crazy, except that they then established that like, okay she was the avatar before Roku and then Roku died at 70 is something they established later on in uh, book three. So you only are going back basically, you know, 170 years to when Kiyoshi died and knowing that she was born 400 years ago, you you have to do the maths and basically say that, oh, she's like 230 uh, and that's the only way it really works. So it, it's little things like that that are kind of like, I think that's to some degree why the writers are always very careful whenever they say a date on anything. And why sometimes we wish they would say more dates to establish stuff in the universe a bit more. But they don't often do it because I feel they made a few mistakes early on. Um, another one, obviously, one that people always point out is um, the whole... It feels like there's a lot of time to pass and the characters feel very old. Yet there's not enough generations with the Fire Lords. Like, they, you basically have to establish that Sozin had a Zulon when he was like... 80 something years old or something like that for the time to fit everything like that like he couldn't possibly have had Sozin when he was in any way youngish in his 20s 30s or 40s because there's just not enough time based on the ages and dates that we do know about so there's a few little things like that of course and then the big one everyone brings up is just you know 10,000 years ago you know the avatars a thousand times a thousand lifetimes how does that work? A few of the maths things with the dates obviously in the series are a little bit like have you really planned this out all that well but you know for the most part it is fine. So uh, yeah let's get into the Sokka stuff which I think is the most important uh, you know stuff in the episode. Sokka and also Suki. So um, with Sokka the big thing here is that they bring back the stuff from basically the start of this episode and also episode one of just Sokka's a little bit sexist here just with some of the comments he's saying about um, girls and what they what he expects kind of girls to be good at versus what he expects men to be good at and here they're obviously captured by the Kyoshi warriors who are an all-female group of warriors and is immediately like where are the men who captured this and then when he goes to see them training he's just like okay you're dancing let me let, let the men do the actual warrior work here and I'll, I'll, I'll do my training and what I like about the episode and how it approaches this arc uh, and this plot within this episode is that like one it is just this one episode. After this, like Sokka, this whole sexist Sokka thing isn't really a thing anymore. So it takes just this one episode to get Sokka past it. And I like that they do it in a way where it's not just this kind of complete destruction of Sokka as a character. They don't really attempt to like label him as someone who is just like anti-women or anything like that. That to some degree they assume this understanding from you based on Sokka's background of just like he is the only warrior in his village at this point in time of course he can say things like I'm the best warrior in my village because for the last couple of while since like all the men went away to fight in the war and he was the only like in any way like man kind of age um, person left in his village he, he technically is the best warrior in his village and um, you can sort of see where that comes from that He's kind of expected to do all this warrior stuff and then everyone else around him 
is basically the women doing all of the stuff in the tribe, like what we see Katara doing in the first couple of episodes and so on. Um, and I don't really think it speaks to, you know, the fact that, like, Sokka is this, like, raging sexist or anything like that, but um, just that he now experiencing more of the world has this kind of learning to do, which immediately happens here because immediately, like, Suki is just like, look, okay, if you think you're so great, show us. And she completely owns him the fight, you know, makes him look like a fool and, you know, leaves him completely embarrassed on the floor. And I like with Suki what they do here is that they don't have her go overboard with the kind of, you know, countering Sokka's sexism. They don't have her go overly girl power and just completely, like, beat Sokka into the ground over everything that he said previously. She obviously is just like, look, you said these things, I'm going to make fun of you for it, but I'm also going to, like, accept how humble your apology is, how, like, honestly you do actually want to learn from us, and actually, like, gives him one-on-one -on -one lessons. I, I like that when it comes down to it, it is this moment for Sokka where he realizes that, look, I was completely wrong. They completely owned me. They're better warriors than I am. I'll go further than just apologizing to them and actually ask to be trained by them. And that speaks, I think, greater for it because it's not just that he's apologizing for like not thinking they were as good a warriors as they were, but he's actually saying, I respect you enough that I, who previously was kind of like anti-women warrior, actually wants to learn from you. So, and of course, they, they continue with it a little bit, you know, you have to wear all of our stuff, and so they have them dress up, you know, in, in the kind of girly outfit, but, you know, you, you have the joke of like, no, it's, it's, a, it's a warrior's outfit, they, all of this stuff represents this, and then Aang says, nice dress, Sokka, so, you know, you have the nice little jokes with it, and then I think most importantly with what they do with the episode is that with Suki, um, they obviously have her be the one who ultimately, like, accepts Sokka and trains him, and I suppose in the end it ends up seeing something in him by actually giving him a chance. That with her, they don't have her just make her mind up based on a few comments he said ha after having only met her for like a couple of minutes. That she actually just bases a lot of how she sees Sokka on how he is once she's actually like training him. And they're past the initial, I don't re think girls can be warriors type thing. And the whole line at the end of just, I'm a warrior, but I'm a girl too, in response to Sokka saying that, you know, like, I treated you like a girl when I should have treated you like a warrior. I think that is so well written, um, and it, it's it's this kind of line from Suki that I think a lot of even modern day kind of shows that kind of have kind of strong female characters could kind of do with kind of including a little bit. Maybe not just take the exact line, but that whole idea of oftentimes you see that, like, okay, female character strong, can fight, you know, can defend herself, but then they often do this thing of, like, we can never have her be in a relationship because that would go against making her strong, whereas I like with Suki that they just have this kind of really realistic thing of just saying that, like, she is skilled, she has skills in martial arts and, you know, being a warrior, but she is still a girl and there's no reason why that would take away her ability to find someone like attractive or actually develop a crush on someone or anything like that. So I kind of like the idea that just in the little time they spent together, it went from being this kind of almost antagonistic thing of just the two don't like each other to actually, once they both gave each other a chance, there is this kind of blossoming relationship just because they did give each other that chance that Sokka was open to accepting women as warriors and then Suki was open to like he can change from feeling that way and in the end you get those moments of like her teaching him and him being you know a little bit effective in the fight of just you know blocking an attack from Zuko and you know you know basically running into battle in the gear that he's not particularly comfortable in and so on and so I definitely will give this episode a lot of credit for just being really really well written and not going down the obvious road because I think nowadays if this type of episode was written it would be so I think heavy on the the girl power side of things and they probably would have been more harsh on Sokka as a character whereas I like here that it is this you know it's a, it's a tough lesson for Sokka to learn here but that it is this really big 
character growth episode for Sokka and you kind of respect him more for kind of just you know getting on his knees to kind of like basically beg to be trained and so I, I think that works really nicely and then I think the biggest success of this episode is obviously that Suki in the early stages of the show was more or less only really planned for this episode and it was everyone basically in the fandom liking her as a character so much that basically prompted the writers to bring her back and um, hence why there is such a big gap between seeing her again because obviously they had planned out most of book one and it was only towards the end of book one going into book two that they realized oh we can bring Suki back in and that's when they of course actually commit to it and make it a big thing but um I think that just that speaks volumes for her as a character that she went from being might only be just in this one episode to now every comic that goes by and Suki's not in it everyone makes a comment everyone's saying where's Suki why is Suki not in this book she's a member of team avatar she's a character we all care about why isn't she be given the same treatment as the other members of team avatar that I think you know even to some degree the writers are are, are shocked that the fans feel this level of kind of um, kind of passion towards Suki as a character um, even now that they've kind of committed to making her a member of the team we want even more than that um, to properly give her more development and I just think that speaks volumes of just like they they saw the fan reaction to a character they had initially only planned to be in one episode and gave the fans what they wanted and it turned out really nicely for the series and that all of Suki's appearances in the show are, are really well done um, but uh, yeah uh, other than that you know Zuko arriving attacking the village um, uh, to obviously get Aang, you know, it, 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 it's the, the fight scene, we see the Kyoshi warriors do their best to fight against the firebenders, but definitely establishing this kind of gap for the most part between benders who are in any way decent and non-benders that the power of bending is very strong and it takes you being an exceptionally powerful non-bender to be able to fight a bender. And I think that's what they show here with the fact that Zuko is able to, for the most part, fend off most of the Kyoshi warriors without really taking any sort of damage and it takes Aang jumping in to be the one who kind of you know is basically defeats Zuko here in in the fight but um yeah we, we, we get some nice moments definitely as the episode kind of approaches the end of just Aang realizing the destruction he's brought and then taking the risky move to time tame the Yunagi again but actually accomplishing it this time um other than that you know I suppose the the Aang and Katara stuff is as I said, it's it's simple, it's effective, um, but it's not the most interesting plot because it is just Katara's a little bit jealous because Aang's getting female attention from the girls in the village, and Aang is impressing everyone except the person he really wants to impress, Katara. And in the end, you know, they just kind of come together. Katara was actually worried for Aang because he was going to increasing lengths to impress the girls, and then Aang realizes that he was letting the the temporary fame go to his head and they have the apology Katara saves Aang from like drowning and from the Unagi and Aang saves the village it, it, it's a nice episode that gives our three main characters something important to do and then introduces a minor character who becomes very important later on so and a very effective first I suppose normal episode in the trend of these um, early-ish mid um, book one episodes being go to a new island, village, town, maybe introduce a new character and see where we go from there. This is one of the most effective uh, uses of that. So in the comments let me know what your thoughts are in this episode. Do you feel as highly abetted as I do? But that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.